All right. Thank you, everyone. So my great pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to share my work with you. And what my lab does, we use uh, stem cells as a model to understand autism. And you probably know that autism is not a single condition. There's several disorders under the umbrella of what we call autism. And people with autism, they have impaired social interactions, they have language problems, they also engage in repetitive or uh, restrictive behavior. And it is a spectrum, and it means that there are some kids that are mildly affected, but there are also more severe types of autism. So there is 1% of the children in the US that would be diagnostic with autism. And if you are a boy, you have higher chances. We, uh, we, if you think that this is a, a pediatric problem only, you are probably wrong, because those kids, they will grow up, and they'll become adults with autism. And that's the, the estimate cost over a lifetime of someone with autism. We don't know what causes autism. We know there is a strong genetic factor, but there is also a contribution from the environment, but we don't quite understand how these two factors interact with each other. So finally, there is no cure for autism. So how do we study autism in the lab? So of course, we would like to have like, some volunteers so we can open the skull and looking for brain cells and start to study the brain, but that's, that's not the case. So we rely on post-mortem brain tissues, but these are really hard to get. And even worse, they represent the end stage of the disease. And we want to know what happens before the disease onset. So we can also use uh, peripheric cell types, and these are easy to get. These are skin cells, blood cells. And, uh, but, but these are hard to follow up with biological experiments because they're not the, the relevant cell types. And, and also, we have animal models, but autism is really a human condition. We are talking about the way we talk to each other, the way we interact. So it's really hard to make interpretations from animal models. So what we do is we take a different strategy. So we take advantage of these per peripheric cell types that are easy to get. And, and we find ways to transform those cells into an immature stem cell state so we can propagate lots of them in the lab. And because they are stem cells, we can induce them or, or we can guide them to specialize into brain cell types. And if you do that with a, a group of uh, patients in a group of control, no affected individual, you can start looking for differences and, and, and ask if there are differences there. And that's exactly what we did. And uh, I'm going to tell you uh, uh, the data that we have from one type of autism in one of the most severest forms of autism, and it's a condition called Rett syndrome. So we did that. We, we have now brain cells from Rett syndrome in the lab, and we start to look under the microscope. And actually, what we found was that the Rett syndrome brain cells are actually smaller compared to normal, non-affected individuals. If you zoom in, in the process of those brain cells, these are neurons, we see also a, re uh, a reduced number of spines in this neuronal process. And those spines are really the structures that the cells uses to communicate, and eventually they will form synapses that how the transmission, uh, the information is transmitted between brain cells. And one can uh, visualize the synapses because we have like some fluorescent markers that will light up when, when the synapses are formed, and these allow us to quantify the number of synapses inside the network, and we realize that uh, the Rett syndrome brain cells actually form a lower number of synapses compared to controls. So that's quite remarkable, because just by looking at the brain cells of someone, you can tell if, if that person has a condition or not. But imagine the possibilities. We can now ask if those differences are permanent. In other words, if you can revert that. So we start treating these brain cells with some chemicals, and we actually find some drugs that are able to, to revert that condition. And we are now expanding uh, this idea to other uh, types of autism. And one way to do that is to take advantage of social networks. So we interact with the families, and we send the Tooth Fairy Kit collection, which is nothing more than a small tube with some solution there. We ask the kids to, uh, to, to put the, the milk tooth in there and send it back to the lab. So we can extract dental pulp cells from those kids. And what we have now is a library of several autistic types of brain cells in the lab. So we can start trying drugs in those cells before we move into the patients. So that's what we do now. And I'll finish just by thanking people uh, from my lab. So these are highly motivated 
and, 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 and people who, who do believe that we can make a difference in our lifetime. Thank you very much. Amazing.